So I gave you this quote from Abraham Lincoln from the Sir Ken Robinson video. So the dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present, meaning the ways that we have traditionally thought about whatever it is we're talking about really aren't adequate to deal with what we're dealing with right now. And here's what I think we're dealing with right now. I think we're at another printing press moment. All right, we don't think much about the printing press. Similarly, like last week I told you about Gordon Moore. And most of you had no idea who Gordon Moore was in terms of the person who we worked with and so on. But this idea of Moore's law is something that we've dealt with for years now. And it has improved a lot of things in life. And with it is also brought along new challenges and new temptations, new issues. And so the question is, how do we deal with that? Because it's not going away and it's only going to increase, as you will see today. So it's not enough to say, I, I get it, here we are, I got it figured out. That's not, that doesn't work anymore. So how do we lead? How do we respond? How do we innovate as Christians? Because you and I are called for such a time as this to respond to technology. But again, part of the problem is we tend to look at technology externally, meaning I use this, I do this. We tend to think of technology always going out. We don't tend to think of it as much, how does it affect us? What is, what's the kickback on that? And that's what we're going to explore today. All right, what is the kickback of, of technology? Because with everything, as we'll see, new opportunities and unintended consequences. So as we move forward here, here's the first point that I want to make. I have three, three big ones today, and they all blend together, and they all lead to one another. And the first one is this, that technology quickly becomes mythic. And here's what I mean. Quoting from a book called The Next Story, written by a guy named Tim Challies, he's quoting a guy named Neil Postman, who I'm now going to quote. So it's the six degrees of Neil Postman. All right. They, meaning technological devices, and abilities have always existed in their current form. They have become part of the natural order of life. They become assumed and we forget that they have not always been a part of our lives. So here's the cool part of being a digital native like you are, meaning you have not known life outside of the current technology that we have. So if I talk about dial-up internet, that's something you have to look up on Wikipedia. All right? But I can remember the day when we got our first computer, the Olsons got their first computer December 1996 and had a 1.5 gigabyte hard drive and a 28.8 modem. And that we were the talk of our, like seriously, like how are you gonna use all that power? Like what are you gonna do with a hard drive that big? And it wasn't too long that my friend Larry Royce, who he and I shared a classroom for years and years, Larry says, Mike, you got a new computer. Oh yeah, what'd you get? He had a bigger hard drive and a 56K modem. He just doubled my speed. And I remember thinking, wow, that's great. And I, I like you a little bit less, all right? Because now you can do things twice as fast. Well, then pretty soon, a faster modem came out. So now we could download our pictures in a steady stream rather than a partial. Because you get about halfway through a picture downloading and then it would stop. And you just hang there. Do I refresh? Because I'm halfway here. I don't know what to do. It's emotional time for us, right? But see, to you, the idea of a, a picture taking a while to, to basically process in front of you, uh, you, you don't know what that's like, right? So you assume this is the way it's always been. And so part of the beauty of that is you are on the cutting edge of a generation that can do amazing things with technology. But the problem is what you don't know can and is affecting you. Some of it negatively, some of it positively, all right? So this idea of technology, in terms of we know it today, it hasn't always been this way. So perspective is really important. So we talk about music. So portable music, you are the generation of the iPod Touch, a multifunction device that is, is designated as a music player, but you can use it entirely without ever the mu using the music function, all right? I'm from the generation of the Sony Walkman, if you'll recall. There's going to be some great 80s moments today. I'm just warning you ahead of time. It's glorious. All right. So let's take a look at something as simple as buying and listening to music. People have been doing this for a long time. It's not a new concept, but I want to show you how much things have changed. All right. I'm going to show you a, a song that I really like. All right.
Now, White Stripes fans will know that's Icky Thump. I really like the song Icky Thump, but about four minutes of Jack White's voice is all I can take without having a medical issue, all right? With all due respect to the hardcore White Stripes fans out there, Jack White is, is limited in his vocal abilities, shall we say. So I, I really like Icky Thump. I can give a shout to Seven Nation Army. Beyond that, I can't deal with White Stripes. I can't deal with Jack White's voice. Now, in the 80s, had Icky Thump come out, this is what my options would have been. I would have gone to Tower Records, because that was my favorite record store, and they had everything. And I would have paid anywhere from $6.44, which is about as cheap as stereo tapes were, or $9.99, which is exorbitantly expensive. And so my hope is that I'll be able to play it on my Sony Sports Walkman, because evidently I was an athlete, and everything in the 80s was yellow for some reason, all right? So I'd put it in my single function device, Sony Walkman, and I would play Icky Thump. Now my hope is that it would be the first song on either side A or the first song on side B. All right, now let me give you the problem with music in the 80s. This is the back of a CD cover from The Grateful Dead, who I also like. And so the, the two songs that I showed here, China Cat Sunflower and Cosmic Charlie, if you, yes, these songs were written under the influence of things. All right, so if it was 1969, all right, I really like song number six and song number eight. Any deadhead will tell you they're absolute classics. The problem is song number seven. This is eight minutes and 30 seconds of the biggest bunch of sonic nonsense ever. With all due respect to the Grateful Dead, my favorite band, here's what What's Become of the Baby is. It is the lead singer, Hi, filtering chants through the sound system for eight and a half minutes. That's all it is. And if it sounds bad, it's actually worse, okay? It's actually worse. And it just goes on and on forever. So here was the conundrum of people in the 80s with tapes. If I want to listen to Johnny Cat Sunflower, and then I want to go to Cosmic Charlie, I have to fast forward. I can't just advance the track. I have to actually fast forward and guess when what's becoming the baby is over. Which means you always go a little too far and then you rewind a little bit up too far the other way, and you end up spending about eight and a half minutes just trying to get to song eight. And so what happens is I would listen to song six, get mad, and never listen to Cosmic Charlie. All right, you just give up, because frankly, that makes my life harder than it needs to be. And this is how it was for all of us in the 80s. When, a, when an album was released, you bought the whole thing. You just like one song, you just hope it's the first song, because then you can skip the rest. But if they bury it in the third, fourth, fifth spot, you have two choices. Listen to it and not like it, or fast forward and rewind, and fast forward and rewind, and fast forward and rewind, and fast forward, and that's how it went over and over and over again. It was very, very frustrating. Well, obviously, that's changed, because now we have the ability to download music. Now, in the late 90s, Napster came along. Napster was the creation of a couple of college guys, both named Sean, who were really good at computer programming and hacking, all right? So what they did is they created the software that allowed you to share your music, upload it, and share it over the internet for free. This is called stealing, all right? But for those of us at the time, Napster was gold. I remember somebody told me about it, like, you should check out this Napster thing, dude. Okay. What can you do with it? You get all kinds of music. Okay. And so, because this is still back in the air of the CDs. Remember the big CD case? You know, right? And you got 500 CDs, 400 of which you don't know what they are. Okay. So it's like, you mean I can just type in a song and go look for it? Yeah. Now the problem was it, was, it was poor quality sometimes, slow bandwidth issues. Right, so my 28.8 modem was, was very taxed by Napster, and, and, and we, would, we would screw up all of the house computing problems because I'm downloading music on Napster all the time, sucking up all the bandwidth. All right? So Napster comes along, and it creates this whole generation of new ways to get music. Now the problem was this was illegal, which was not a problem for some, but in, in ethical senses it was illegal. Enter iTunes. 
Right? So iTunes changed the way we buy music. And why do we like iTunes? First, because you get things on demand. Not only do I not have to go to Tower Records and hope they have the tape that I want, I don't even have to go to Amazon.com and order the CD and wait for it to come in the mail in the next three to seven business days. Or more if I want to jack up my shipping costs. I can get it right now, on demand. Second thing, I can only get the songs, I only have to get the songs that I want. So if I just want Icky Thump, which is all I wanted, that's all I have to get. And so that's my happy Jack White moment, and he can keep the rest, okay? So I just get the songs that I want. Now I can make custom playlists. I don't have to pay attention to the original vision of the artist. So as the artist created this album, this was their vision of it, this is how they wanted it to be experienced, this is the album artwork that, that they had with it, this is the story. Nope, I can just go make my own playlist. I don't need your input, you just make good music. I'll give you my 99 cents and I'll do with it what I want. So I have control. And then finally, you can share it. Right? All of a sudden now, I can't, if I was going to give you my Grateful Dead tape, you could essentially tape that one song onto another tape, which means you lose quality. You have to do all the rewinding, fast forwarding. It's just, it was a high maintenance piece of work. Now, I have this, I have this file. What kind of file? Well, it's a music file, just like a picture, just like a video clip, just like a document, it's a file. I can do with it what I want, right? So you notice all of this, who has control? I do, as the consumer. Once I have it, my mentality is, it's mine. I can do with it what I want. And I get it now, and I get it on my terms. All right? Now, let's talk about viewing music. I grew up doing the original heyday of MTV. MTV came out in 1981, first video, it's called Video Killed the Radio Star by the Buggles. There's your useless trivia for the day. So MTV, when it originally came out, just showed videos 24 hours a day. And there weren't that many videos yet because it was new. So you saw a lot of the same videos. I have seen every Duran Duran video about 413 times because they were one of the main bands of the early days of MTV. So, there was one video, I was, in the 80s I was a big metal head, all right? And I was an 80s metal head, which is a bit troubling, but anyway, you got to do what you got to do. So I'm going to show you 42 seconds of some of the best 80s hair metal. I loved this song, and I loved this video. So go in the Wayback Machine, if you would, to 1987. This is all real. The special effects budget was, was low for this. Watch the tape, the best part. <laughs> My kids at home are like, really dad? I'm like, hey, it's all we had. Back off the old man, all right? So, I really like that song. It's called Blow Your Speakers by a man called Manowar, who I believe is still around, which is unbelievable in and of itself. Now, if I wanted to see the Blow Your Speakers video, I basically had one choice, and that was to watch something called Headbangers Ball. I don't even know if they still have Headbangers Ball, but Headbangers Ball in the late 80s was a show that I believe it started at 10 p.m. Saturday night and went to like 1 a.m. Sunday morning. And they showed nothing but heavy metal videos. So from Metalhead, this was an escape from Duran Duran, okay? This was the time we could watch our music. So if I wanted to see Blow Your Speakers, this is what I had to do. I had to tune in at 10 o'clock, and I basically had to watch the whole thing. Because if they play it at all, they could play it at any time. They could play it at 10.30, they could play it at 12.47 a.m. And I had church the next day, and this was also on at the same time as Saturday Night Live. So it was kind of an emotional time for me, a lot of decisions to make, okay? So if I wanted to watch this video, this is what I had to do. So I could watch all of Headbangers Ball, and they'll never show my video, and that's just the way life 
went. All right? That's all that it was. Now think about TV. Uh, evidently watching a very happy, funny TV show. Okay? Think about TV. Digital TV with on-demand, TV on your schedule. So one of the things that, that technology has done, it has made the concept of time very fluid. I don't have to pay attention as much to time when things are on, when it's going to air, because I have other options. So if you want to watch a lot of TV, you don't even need cable. You get any of these services, you get TV quickly, and you get it on your schedule, your terms, your time, and essentially you can do whatever you want with it. It seems like, I mean, half of YouTube is just one massive copyright violation. Right? And you can do a lot of things with technology. You don't want to pay for the song? Well, you can go to YouTube, you figure out a few little software things, you, you can have the song. So there's all kinds of new ethical situations that your generation has to deal with that mine didn't. So we had to put up with hairband metal. You have to put up with ethical issues, all right? I'm not sure it's an even trade. So here's the second point. Whenever we get a new piece of technology, it brings with it new opportunities, and that's great. What you in particular, and parents in particular, have to be aware of are the unintended consequences that come with that. Because any time you bring something new into your life, it's going to bring with it new situations. So the question is, how do you deal with it? Because if you don't, it will deal with you. These are examples of, of technological devices, some newer, some older, that are all becoming obsolete because of smartphones. Most of these things, single function devices. Now, all this isn't bad, right? I love the fact that I can do all of these things on my phone if I need it. That saves me time. That's very efficient. I can do a lot of things that I couldn't have done before. So this isn't all bad, but just to understand, with this comes other issues. All right? Tower Records is no longer in business. Tower Records was an absolute monster corporation in the 80s, and they're out of business. Because the idea of going to buy music at a store why would you do that? Why would you make the trip? Why would you... That doesn't, that doesn't make sense. So the problem wasn't Tower Records. The problem was we changed. And Tower, in a sense, couldn't change. Part because iTunes captured the market quickly. Now think about pornography here for a second. There are two red-letter years in the history of pornography. One of them is 1988. 1988, the state of California Supreme Court decided that the creation of pornography and any profits that came from it were not considered prostitution. Now, make no mistake, that's absolutely false. But they said legally, you can create this. People having sex for money on two different levels. If that's not prostitution, I don't know what is, but the state of California where that about 80, 90 percent of all porn in the U.S. is made in the San Fernando Valley, said, no, nope, it's not prostitution. So that solved the first issue for pornographers, that of can we do this legally. The state of California said, yes, you can. But they had another issue. So the next red letter year for pornography was 1993. This was the year that the internet became widespread. This solved pornography's second issue, which was distribution. We have the product, we have a, a market, how do we gather the two? And so here's what this looks like on a practical level. All right, when I was a teenager, you wanted to look at pornography, you had to find somebody who had it. You had to ask them face to face for it, usually under the code language of, can I borrow that for a little bit? Then you had to find a way to smuggle it home. Then you had to find a way to smuggle it into your house. Then you had to find a place to put it where your mother wouldn't think to look for it. Then you had to make time to use it. You had to make time and make sure you had enough time so you became very knowledgeable about your parents' schedules. So there were seven or eight steps involved in actually consuming the pornography. And each step gave you a chance to rethink your actions. 
all of that is gone. Because now two things have changed. One, pornography is now a $10 billion a year industry, and it's everywhere. And two, it now seeks you out. I never had to worry about seeing something flash up on my computer in high school, and even college for that matter, because the monitors, frankly, were green. And all they gave you were numbers. And no offense to math people, but math's not real sexy, okay? So that wasn't an issue for me. The fact that I was bad at math was the issue. But the pornography wasn't a problem. Now, pornography is everywhere, and it is actively seeking you out. And the starting point now, baseline pornography, is far beyond what it was in the 80s. It's a different starting point. All of this is made possible by great technology. Faster, sooner, more, bigger bandwidth levels. So pornography went from, from static images on a page to moving parts. And pornographers are very devious and they're very smart at what they do. So with every technology comes new opportunities and also unintended consequences. Your generation and, and those of us who are parents have to deal with pornographies in ways that our parents, my parents, did not. Okay? So let me tell you why this matters. Let, let's think about this. This is the biggest point of all. You cannot hold technology at arm's length like we used to. Okay? Technology doesn't tweak, it transforms. You are immersed in it all the time. To think that you can live in this culture and not be affected by technology is the same thing as saying, I can jump in the swimming pool, but I, can, I won't be wet. Nope, you're wet. Deal with it. So here we go. Another quote from uh, the next story. A technology changes the entire environment it operates in. It changes the way we perceive the world. It changes the way we understand ourselves. It changes the way we understand ourselves. Now, I'm going to show you a clip here that we watched in a previous chapel, and this is very funny, and it's also very accurate. So watch this clip with this quote in mind. Do you feel that we now, in the 21st century, we take technology for granted? Well, yeah, because now we live in an, in an amazing, amazing world, and it's wasted on the, on the crappiest generation of just spoiled idiots <laughs> that don't care, because this is what people are like now. They got their phone, and they're like, ugh, it won't... Give it a second! <laughs> give it, it's going to space! <laughs> Can you give it a second to get back from space? Is the speed of light true? true. Yeah. Yeah. I was on a, I was on an airplane and there was internet, high speed internet on the airplane. That's yes. the newest thing that I know exists. And I'm sitting on the plane and they go, open up your laptop, you can go on the internet. And it's fast and I'm watching YouTube clips. It's I'm in an airplane. And then it breaks down. And they apologize, the internet's not working. The guy next to me goes, <laughs> Like, how quickly the world owes him something yes. he knew existed only 10 seconds ago. Right. So you see that clip a little differently now when you think about it this way. And, just, and, and, and think about this. So, like, if I'm downloading a song off iTunes and I lose my connection and you get the sweet little circle with the white X, that's frustrating. Or you're going to turn on Netflix. You're going to watch Netflix. You're going to stream something. Network error. I mean, I literally like, well, like, what am I supposed to do now? Right? Because that was, that was my whole plan. That was plan A, B, and C right there, and I have a network error. So you restart it, you reset it, you hope for the best, or you get poor cell reception, and you look around you like, these people raised by wolves? Like, how do you, how do you live? What's the matter with you? <laughs> right? That's, that's all learned behavior that didn't used to be I, I, I didn't get a cell phone until I was 34 I know some of you are like how and you're still here good for you Mike all right I got a cell phone because I had to get one I actually put it off as long as possible well because I don't like talking on the phone all right so don't call me all right so it's just like wait now this like anybody can call me at any time rats all right but your generation 
What do you mean you didn't have a cell phone until you were 34? You're going to die soon. You should probably get on that, man. All right? <laughs> it's a different way of thinking about technology. And it changes the way we see ourselves. It changes the way we see God. And it changes the way we see others. So here's what, going back to Napster. Napster created a whole generation of people who thought that music should be free. A huge level of hypocrisy here. Because the same people who thought that musicians should give out their livelihood for free would never work for free in their own job. Really? You, you sell insurance, right? Do you work for salary? Yeah, but music should be free? <laughs> of course. See, we're affected by the culture that we're living in. Nobody ever said music should be free. What? Now, if an artist wants to do that, that's their prerogative. But that's not what this generation believes. They're like, no, it just should be free. I should have access to it whenever I want, however I want, on demand. All right? Now, you know this, right? So you're going to buy, you just want to buy a song, and then you get the sweet album only. Does that make you mad? Like, but I don't... I don't want the whole album. I just want that song. Why do I jump back 20 years? You know what we said? Well, of course I'd buy the whole album to get that song. What, what other choice do I have? So there's a certain amount of like, you know what, you just, you kind of work with the system. Now what's the belief? The system should work for me. Because I'm the point. And so now this changes the way we see ourselves. And so, quoting again from the next story, what becomes mythic is only one step removed from becoming idolatrous. And here comes the big problem. All right. Here comes the big problem. This is a book that I finished recently, and I'm going to read a, a, an excerpt from me or to you here. This is a guy, uh, Nick Bilton is his name, who wrote the book, and he is the tech blog editor at the New York Times. So th this, is, this is the world he lives in. So as I read this part, this is just a few paragraphs here, Listen for the idolatry. Listen to how the, the, everything has shifted here. All right? So he says, if you pull out your smartphone and click the button that says locate me on your Google or Yahoo map application, you will see a small dot appear in the middle of your screen. That's you. If you start walking down the street in any direction, the whole screen will move along with you, no matter where you go. This is a dramatic change from the print-on-paper world, where maps and locations are based around places and landmarks, not on you or your location. People don't go to the store and say, oh, excuse me, can I buy a map of me? You go to the store and ask for a map of New York or Amsterdam or the subway system. You and I aren't anywhere to be seen on these maps. The maps are locations we fit into. But today's digital world has changed that. Kevin Slavin, a creator of location-based games and services and the co-founder of the gaming company Area Code put this succinctly at a technology conference last year. Quote, we are always at the center of the map. Though Slavin was talking about location-based games and Google Maps, the center of the map, it turns out, is actually much bigger than a dot on the screen. It's a very powerful place to be. Being in the center instead of somewhere off to the side or off the page altogether, changes everything. It changes your conception of space, time, and location. It changes your sense of place and community. It changes the way you view the information, news, and data coming in over your computer and your phone. And it changes your role in a transaction, empowering you to decide quite specifically what content to buy and how to buy and use it, rather than simply accepting the traditional material that companies have packaged on your behalf. Now listen to this. Now you are the starting point. Now the digital world follows you, not the other way around. So you have to understand that's very intoxicating. And intoxicated people tend to do stupid things. All right? So, we take a look at idolatry here. This is, a, this is Romans 11.36 from last week. If I read this, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. I don't see us being the center of the map there. God is the center of the map. Now, if you've gone to Christian school for any length of time, you've got a church for any length of time, you're like, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. It's about God, not me. It's but pause for a second. 
Does your use of technology show that theology? Or is your use of technology something different, something darker? You go back to this idea. We are always the center of the map. We are always the starting point. So what I'm going to show you here is what that might look like in the next 10 to 15 years. We don't know, but as you watch this, take a look if, if my clicker will work and see how technology changes. Here we go. Whoop, go back. Technology is great, isn't it? All right. Well, I just want it to go right here. Okay. There we go. Here's technology in the next 10, 15 years. In early 2011, Corning, a global specialty glass and ceramics manufacturer based in upstate New York, created a video called A Day Made of Glass. Corning published this video online and gave us all a glimpse into the near future. In a remarkably short period of time, this visionary video captured the imaginations of millions, while demonstrating how highly engineered glass, with companion technologies, will help shape our world. In this video, we've built upon that vision. It's still a day made of glass, but we've expanded our thinking, and we take you to a few different places. In this version, I'll be your guide. Along the way, we'll pause to examine some of the technologies displayed, and I'll talk about what's possible and what's not. So follow me as we visit a day in the future. Right, now let's go inside. This is Amy's room. She's not quite awake yet. And this is her tablet. These will be as commonplace as the mobile phone is today. Uh-oh, looks like her alarm's about to go off. Amy's tablet captures organizes and displays all her favorite things. It also helps her at school and manages her schedule. It's encased entirely in an incredibly thin, lightweight, highly durable glass with specialized optics. Her bedroom window. It's electrochromic. It changes state from opaque to transparent on demand. Now, I'm not sure if you noticed, but this closet door is actually a display driven by Amy's tablet. All the intelligence that you see on this display, all these apps, they're all residing and running on Amy's tablet. This display spans the entire door. It has its own small footprint operating system and is smart enough to be aware of Amy's device. And based upon proximity and other rules, it knows what to display and in what format. To make this part of Amy's day a reality, Corning is helping to deliver large-scale, edge-to-edge -edge displays. Corning looks to partners for operating systems and apps that seamlessly scale and transfer between tablets and larger displays. Ah, looks like we're off to school. Excellent. Let's catch a ride, shall we? This is Sarah, Amy's sister. Her tablet is just like Amy's. It's her primary computing device too. Uh-oh, this looks like mischief. This dashboard is made from formed, thin, durable glass. It feels better than plastic and it looks better too. It's also a display, which means it can take on the appearance of pretty much anything. Of course, in driving mode, its function is to display critical and ancillary driving information. In tomorrow's world, configurable touch dashboards will be the norm. We'll have displays everywhere, not just in the home and in the office, but in your car too. Notice how Sarah's tablet was able to inform the car display? That certainly did. Okay, so how close are we to this? Well. It's doable now, but not at this scale and not at an affordable price. Further innovation in manufacturing is needed to get us there on a broad scale. Automotive electrochromic glass? That's possible now. And not just that, Corning can deliver window and sunroof glass solutions 
that offer reductions in vehicle gross weight of up to 50 pounds or 22 kilograms. And that improves CO2 emissions, fuel consumption, and handling performance. One thing is for certain, tomorrow we'll be much better at harnessing energy from renewable sources. At Corning, we're striving to improve solar technology. There's no reason to think that the rooftops of tomorrow will not be covered in low-cost, high-efficiency, photovoltaic cells. And with improved aesthetics, today's unsightly solar panel will be tomorrow's attractive architectural feature. Imagine a school that's not just energy independent, but a school that's an energy provider. Now, this is a classroom I would have been excited to be in. There's a display, not just at the head of the class, but on every desktop. Large scale, seamless, thin, durable glass. All of it fronting low power, small footprint operating systems that communicate and serve as displays for personal computing devices. Look at this. Had these been at school when I was a boy, you wouldn't have been able to get me out of the classroom. This is the class community activity table. And again, we see large scale, seamless design, logic enabled, durable, multi-touch glass. This may look like science fiction, but these already exist today. Perhaps not in this size or in this setting, but tables with interactive touch surfaces like this are being readied and deployed now. As software and touch interfaces advance, Corning expects community activity tables and interactive wall displays to be featured in classrooms globally. Now let's go and see what Dad's up to. Beautiful, isn't it? All that logic encased in low-profile, thin, resilient, touch-sensitive glass. I know what you're thinking. Why would one want an old glass room? Well, for starters, these walls could be active displays and configured for different situations depending on the required purpose of the room. Here, Dan is in a video conference and the entire glass wall has become the display. Edge to edge, seamless and touch sensitive. It's as if the remote location were now part of his room, making it easier to share and collaborate. Now that's breaking down barriers. This is really going to change the way we work. In here, all these surfaces, on all this equipment, are glass. Its pristine, non-porous and easy cleaning qualities make it ideal for sterile environments or any place where bacteria and viruses need to be contained. And with Corning's research efforts in the area of antimicrobial surface technology, we imagine a specialty glass that inhibits the growth of microorganisms. With that, our tomorrow could be a safer place. Pretty amazing, isn't it? All that data, captured a world away, transported, then displayed here, all in the blink of an eye. Wow. Although, just imagine the bandwidth needed to carry the data for this projection. And for that next generation, high definition glass video display, simultaneously. Yeah, a lot. Well, we're thinking about that at Corning too which is why we're preparing our glass optical fiber products to carry the massive surge in bandwidth required for scenarios just like this. Dan's got quite the job, doesn't he? Let's go see what Amy's up to. Looks like she's on the school field trip. Spectacular, isn't it? A large scale, durable information wall made of glass.
This is dynamic interactive signage at an entirely different level. It creates a barrier where you need one. It's informative, it's interactive, it's aesthetically pleasing, it doesn't block the landscape. In fact, in this case, it enhances it. And it's made of glass. When it's not displaying information, it's transparent. Can we do this today? Not quite. Hiding all those electronics while retaining optical clarity is tricky at this scale. We'll get there though. Starting with smaller devices, a bit like what these kids have. Perfect for augmenting reality. Let's watch what goes on here. These tablets with onboard 3D cameras, sophisticated microprocessors and graphic subsystems can perform quickly enough to make sense of the immediate environment and to augment it with additional relevant content. All wrapped up in a durable, thin glass. Perfect for education. And perfect for a bit of fun too. That was an exciting day for Amy. And here at home, her tablet drives the family room edge-to-edge -edge wall display. Proximity-based authentication is all that's needed to establish a pairing. Now she can share all the best bits of her field trip with her family in next-gen, high-definition 3D. So here we are at the end. Right as Sarah completes her homework and prepares for bed, the glass optical fiber lighting dims and the house settles in for the close of a day made of glass. Of course, this is not just a story about glass. It's a story about a shift in the way we will communicate and use technology in the future. It's a story about ubiquitous displays, open operating systems, shared applications, cloud media storage and unlimited bandwidth. We know there are many obstacles to be overcome before what we've just seen can become an attainable, reliable reality. But at Corning, we believe in this vision and we're not waiting. Care to join us? Cool. <laughs> so, as we wrap up here, I just want to say this. So, in the why does this matter? If that's 10 to 15 years away, that means you are going to be raising your kids in that environment that they are going to be viewing as myth mythic. You're going to be the workforce. So if some of you are looking at, okay, I'm going to go to med school and I'm going to become a doctor, how are you going to handle that? So as a, as a parent, there's parents today really worried about screen time, media consumption. You know what the most untrue image of that whole video was, came at the tail end. What does she do? Closes up her tablet, goes right to sleep. Are you kidding? <laughs> do you know how overstimulated you would be? You wouldn't sleep for days. <laughs> right? And then we'd be able to see your giant red bloodshot eyes up on a life-size wall-to-wall screen. Okay? <laughs> so, so, here's the thing. The next generation, your kids, going to view that as mythic. Secondly, with every technology comes new opportunities and unintended consequences. So as Christians, how do we maximize those opportunities for the kingdom of God? How do we understand, manage the unintended consequences? Because as I watch that, what do we talk about? Technology has, has helped pornography become a $10 billion a year business. Why? Primarily through distribution. You think of pornography as addicting now? Wait till it gets there. I'm dead serious. How do we, how do we respond to that? How do we handle that? What is our response to that? And ultimately, it doesn't tweak, it transforms. It becomes the point. That whole day could easily place us at the center of the map.
because wherever we are, we have access to whomever and whatever we want in real time, on demand, in as lifelike an image as possible. How do we respond to that temptation? And I mean the temptation to make ourselves the center of the map. That's why it matters, folks, how we think about this. And as adults, how are we going to prepare teenagers to respond to that? We can't just say, hey, good luck. How do we, we're in this together, absolutely in this together. So what do we do? How do we do this? How do we keep ourselves believing and thinking that to God be the glory? Because to him and from him are all things. How do we do that? All right, that's where we are. Class rolls at 1040. Have a good day.